I'm Ryan Felthouse, and welcome to Felthouse Family Woodworks. For intricate end grain patterns and designs, you want to select timber that has very rich and contrasting colors. For instance, my walnut has a very consistent dark coloration throughout. My purple heart has a very deep, rich purple. And my hard maple has a very brilliant white. This is going to give me excellent contrast throughout my build. First, I'm bringing all of my lumber to the chop saw to cut it down to 36 inches. This is a comfortable length for running the pieces on the joiner and table saw. Now, I'm running one edge of each of my pieces on the joiner. This is going to give me a straight reference edge against my table saw fence. Next, making sure I have the jointed edge against the table saw fence, I'm going to cut down all of my pieces to my rough dimensions. Now that I have all of my rough dimensions, I'm going back to the joiner to flatten and square all of my boards before I run them on the table saw and planer for my final dimensioning. Here, I'm running the maple accent strips through my drum sander to achieve 1 8 inch thickness. Here are my final pieces. Six maple strips at 1 8 by two and three eighths. Three purple heart pieces at three quarter by two and three eighths. Six walnut pieces at five eighths by two and three eighths. Six pine pieces at three eighths by two and three eighths. Six maple strips at one eighth by three and one eighth. Three purple heart pieces at three quarter by three and one eighth. Okay, now that we've dimensioned all of our timber, it's time to get ready for our first glue up. Now, I'm organizing all of my 2 and 3 8 inch pieces for the first glue up. My order is pine, walnut, maple, purple heart, maple, walnut, pine. Organizing all of the sausages beforehand is very helpful for keeping the glue up process as simple as possible. For this glue up, I'm going to need all of my 2 and 3 8 inch pieces, type bond 3, glue roller, straightening sticks, and extra F or C clamps. Now it's time for our first glue up. In case you don't know, it's extremely important to use non-toxic, food safe wood glue for cutting board builds. I always use type bond 3. As you can see, I like to be extremely generous when applying my glue. It's better to have excess than not enough. I use my straightening sticks and F-clamps on the top and bottom at the beginning, middle, and end of my glue up to keep everything in line and straight. Now it's time to tighten the clamps. Always remember, don't over tighten your clamps as it can lead to warping or disfiguring of your workpiece. I apply enough tension that it's tight and I get sufficient squeeze out, but I'm not wrenching down on the handle. Here are some side views of my first glue up to give another perspective on all of the clamps and the squeeze out. Alright, we've been clamped for about 16 hours now. Let's get all these clamps off, clean off our excess glue, and move on to the next step. Here you can see I'm loosening and removing all of the clamps. I use my rubber mallet to knock off the straightening sticks. As I clearly demonstrated, be mindful when working in the shop with others. One thoughtless move and you can send projectiles flying at your fearless camera crew. Once I've chiseled off the dry glue, 
I'll run the sausages on the joiner to flatten, clean, and square the bottom surface. This will give me a flat and square reference for when I dimension these pieces through the planer. I have my joiner set to about 1 64th of an inch for these passes. I'm only trying to clean up and square the bottom surface. It's important to do light passes and not overwork the piece. You can easily get carried away, over mill, and end up with a piece that's too small for the next step. Now I'm running the sausages through the planer, bringing them down to my target dimension. Again, do very light passes to creep up on your measurements. This is a picture of the piece at the target dimension of two and a quarter inch. I'm making a mark at perfect center. Once I've marked out my control piece, I'll bring these over to the table saw. Also, do yourself a favor and make marks across the tops of your sausages to label and keep your two halves together. Cutting my control piece first, it's incredibly important to make sure the saw blade is dead center with the line I marked. Rip all three sausages in half and keep the pairs together. Now, still keeping them in pairs, I'm planing the pieces down to the target dimension of one inch. Here is where labeling the tops of those pieces will really come in handy to keep your pairs together. Now that I've achieved the one inch thickness, it's time to prepare our second weave. My second weave will be made from my three and one eighth inch pieces of maple and purple heart. As you can see, they're a little taller than the sausages, so I'm trimming them down on the table saw to match the width before our second glue up. Now that we've jointed, ripped, and planed our first glue up into two one inch halves, we're ready to add our second weave. All right, here we go. I'm following the same steps as my first glue up, but now the order is sausage, maple, purple heart, maple, sausage. Here we are after the second glue up. It's a good perspective to see the order and clamp set up again. All right, so we've had these glued up overnight. We're gonna get them out of the clamps, clean up our glue, mark, and cut out our knives. Now that I have scraped off the dry glue, I'm joining my pieces with a very light pass just to clean up the surface. I can't emphasize enough just how light this pass is. It could literally be done with sandpaper but to save time, I'm using my joiner. The same goes for this next step. I'm just planing enough to clean the pieces so they run smooth on my table saw. If you look closely, you can even still see my pencil marks. That's enough. Now that they're cleaned up, I'm cutting one saw blade thickness off the end of my control piece. This gives me a clean surface for marking out my diamonds. Here you can see the sausages next to each other with the control piece on the right. First, I'm checking that everything is square and lined up. Next, I mark center in both directions. Now, using my square and 45 degree angle gauge, I mark the first side of my diamond. Using that first line as my reference point, and my 45 degree angle gauge, I mark out the rest of the diamond. The easiest way to do this is to line up three points of your angle gauge with your center lines and reference mark. I use my 45 degree angle gauge to set my table saw at exactly 45 degrees. It is so important to get this angle exact. Even if you're off by a hair, it will throw off your entire pattern. Before I cut, I set the fence so the blade is about a 64th of an inch outside of my pencil line. Now, I score the piece just ever so slightly. I'll check my score, then I'll walk the fence in until the blade is literally splitting my pencil line. 
With the fence set, I run one pass on all sausages. For consistency in your milling, run all pieces in the same orientation. Now I rotate the pieces 90 degrees clockwise and run all of them again. Theoretically, the fence should already be set correctly for this pass, but always check first to confirm that the blade is splitting your pencil line. All right, after those cuts, your sausages should look like little A-frames. Now I'm checking the first half of my diamond to make sure it's nice and square. I use my angle gauge to set my table saw at exactly 90 degrees. I make sure my sausage is oriented correctly. And just like our two previous cuts, I set the fence so the blade is about a 64th of an inch outside of my pencil line. Now I'll do the same procedure. I'll score the piece, check the cut, and then walk the fence in until the blade is literally splitting my pencil line. Now I run two passes on all the sausages to finish out the diamonds. Now that those are cut, the rough dimension should be two and an eighth by two and an eighth. I'm going to take all of these pieces over to the chop saw, cut them into six 18 inch lengths and continue this pattern using five of them. You're more than welcome to use all six. My board is a custom order, so I'm only using five to reach my target dimension board width of 10 inches. Here I have my five pieces laid out in the orientation for my next glue up. Now I'll mark out all these pieces before my next step. Please reference the manual for the marking layout. I use blue masking tape for the sake of clarity in the video. As you can see, I have an X side and a Y side. The joints are labeled A, B, C, and D. Now I'm going through and making a 1 16th reference mark along the A, B, C, and D glue joints. Here are all of the marked pieces before the planing process. Excellent! Now that we've cut out our diamonds, established our pattern, labeled our pieces, marked out our glue joints, we're ready to send these pieces through the planer. And this is where our careful labeling is really going to come in handy. For our first pass, we will take YA and DY and rotate them so that way the A surface is facing up, D surface is facing up. Now we're going to take our three center pieces and we're just going to go ABC. A surface up, B surface up, C surface up. And now we will run 1 16th of an inch off of all these surfaces. Once we've taken off exactly 1 16th of an inch, both of the end pieces are done. Now we're going to rotate all three center pieces 180 degrees. B side up. C side up, D side up. Now run these through, taking off a total of 1 16th of an inch. Now that we're done planing, we're ready for our third glue up. Here I am setting up all my clamps and following the exact same process as the previous two glue ups. In case you haven't noticed already, I have a very convenient glue up jig that is removable and adjustable. What makes this jig so great 
is that it holds your clamps perfectly flat and parallel to your work pieces. This makes my glue ups more accurate and stable. Now with this being one of the most important steps, I had to bring in a qualified professional to assist in the shop. Now that our glue up is cured overnight, let's get this out of the clamps, clean up our glue, and move on to the next step. Here I have my crosscut sled set up on the table saw, and I'm going to cut a saw blade thickness off the face so I have a clean surface for making my marks. Now I'll set up my piece in my table vise. I mark 1 16th of an inch on the top and bottom for planing reference. Always remember to make light passes when planing down to an exact thickness. The reason I make the reference line is to plane to it and not below it. Then check my measurements. This accuracy is very important for lining up the pattern. Okay, now that we process this piece through the planer, we are going to go around and just check some of the dimensions to make sure that it's lining up with itself. One of the first dimensions that I'm going to check is the intervals between the tops of the weaves here. So you can see mine is at exactly one and a sixteenth. One and a sixteenth. Looks beautiful all the way across. Now what we're going to do, flip it over, check the other side to make sure the tops of our weaves again are matching up. One and a sixteenth, one and a sixteenth, one and a sixteenth, looking beautiful all the way across. Now we're gonna go on N and double check our thickness. Our target dimension is two inches, so let's just make sure that we are looking good. Beautiful. All right, this piece, is all good and ready for the next step. Okay, so I have my crosscut sled all set up and I'm ready to go. But one thing you want to take into account is the thickness of your board. For my board, my target dimension is inch and a half thickness. So therefore, I'm going to set my crosscut sled at inch and five eighths. This is going to give me a whole eighth of an inch for planing and sanding, bringing my board down to its final dimension. As I cut these pieces, you can see I put them to the side. I keep them in order and in the orientation in which they came off the saw. This is important for achieving the most consistency in your pattern. And now for our moment of truth. But before we dive right into this, do yourself a favor and mark your pieces in the orientation in which they came off of the crosscut sled. Now let's reveal our pattern. All right, here we go. We're ready for the final reveal. I always like to flip my pieces in the exact same orientation every time to keep the pieces in line and in order. And there you have it the double felt house weave. All right, now I've reorganized all the pieces and I'm gonna try a different technique for creating a different look and manipulating the pattern. So this is gonna be a book matching technique. Let's separate these into pairs. And now let's open up the center seam. I really like 
like this look. It gives it a cool kind of shoelace type knot, but it also accents the grain. When you do book matching, it's going to open up those grains so you have a mirrored effect, which is really beautiful and excellent for your finish. Okay, once you found a look that you enjoy, go on ahead and mark your top orientation and let's get ready for the next glue up. Before I start the fourth glue up, I'm milling up a couple of pieces of pine to use as sacrificial end caps. These will protect the pattern from any scarfing or tear out when we send it through the planer after this glue up is cured. I also cut two pieces of pine to use as straight edges along the sides to hold the pattern in line while I tighten the clamps. These can be a little tricky, so if you have an extra set of hands, I recommend asking for some assistance. So now that we've had this curing in the clamps for about 12 hours, let's get it out, clean up the glue, and move on to the next step. Here you can see I knock off the pine straight edges and clean up the excess glue. Okay, now that we have all the glue cleaned off our piece, we're ready to send this through the planer. One topic people bring up with me is sending end grain through a planer. This is an acceptable technique. One, you want to make sure you have your end caps glued on two, that your glue is cured for a minimum of 12 hours, and three, you do extremely light passes of around 128th of an inch per pass. At this point, you could plane your piece to your final thickness, but this is a custom order, so I still have one more step, and I'm only cleaning the surfaces to prepare for my side caps. Now that we're done planing, we're ready to give this board our signature look. For me, this is a custom order. I'm going to be adding maple side caps, handle, juice groove, and rubber feet. I look forward to seeing your signature looks. Now that we've added our signature styles, let's move on to popping the grain and finish sanding. All right, now we're ready to pop the grain and finish sand our board. In order to do so, we're going to need a few tools. I have my pencil, palm sander, all my grits of sandpaper, I have 60, 150, 220, and 320, and also a bucket of clean water and a rag. Let's get started. The first thing I do is lightly mark every side of my board. Then I go through and fully sand away the pencil marks. When I'm done sanding, I'll go through and inspect the board for any checks, holes, or imperfections that I want to fill before I move on. Depending on the size of the imperfection, I'll either fill it with wood glue or I'll make a sawdust and wood glue paste of the appropriate species to fill the void. Now I take a wet rag and wipe down all the surfaces of the board. This is called popping the grain. However, you don't want to oversaturate the board. You just want to get it wet enough that the grain can absorb some moisture and rise back up. I repeat this process with 60, 150, and 220 grit. For my final pass, I lightly mark all surfaces of the board. Then I go through and thoroughly sand with 320 grit, eliminating any imperfections that may still be visible. Do not pop the grain after this pass. Now that we've popped the grain and 
done our finished sanding, we're ready to give this board a quick dip in the mineral oil bath. We're going to let it sit, drip dry for about an hour, wipe off the excess, and give it our final treatment. For all of the most crucial parts of the process, I like to bring in my trusted assistant. All right, we've let this board drip dry for about an hour. I'm gonna wipe off the excess oil and then give it a final treatment of a beeswax mineral oil mixture of about four to one. Put on my rubber feet and call this board done. As I said, I use a four to one ratio beeswax mineral oil for the finished coat. If you're planning to add rubber feet Pre-drill all your screw holes and use a handheld screwdriver. Power drills can easily strip out your pilot holes, which is a major headache to deal with. Take it from me, I've done it many a time before. And here you have it, your very own felt house weave. I hope you enjoyed this build as much as I did.